Now, just to get it out of the way, because I'm sure there have already been 30 questions about it. Um, was the was lullabies the one where the symbols were cut separate? Yeah, first time ever I've done that in my life. First and last. Yeah, it, it's become a thing where every band in the world likes to do it. Like in here, there's even a different name for it. Oh God, what's it called? Skins and uh, I can't even remember what, like there's a whole phrase for the cutting the drum separate thing. But they did it once as an experiment, like, and it was a sonic choice, right? He wanted to have more control over the symbols for the mix. Yeah, they, well, they've done it on every record except the first record. So first record, oh, really? live, live drum kit, normal. They did it on rated R and out. So oh, I didn't realize that. I thought that it was only on lullabies. No, every record, but but the reason he does it is because Josh doesn't like symbols, and he likes room. And obviously when you're playing heavy and you're beating cymbals, your room is full of cymbals. So the beauty of doing it is being able to mic a tom from eight inches away or a foot away and getting that space. So, so the way we did it was we'd set the drum kit up like normal, dial in a drum sound, and then just take the cymbals off. So then Joey Castillo would play kick, snare, and toms. And was he hitting a bag or, or something? Or? Well, to keep time, we tried to integrate electronic pads. So we'd put a pad in there and have a hi-hat sound that we can hear a hat. But he's such a, a heavy drummer that he would eat through these pads like nobody's business. So at some point, we're like, hey, man, we don't have any more pads. So you're going to have to hit your leg or something. And then we put the cymbals back on and pull all the drums out. And that, that was much easier because he's playing, but, you know, he's hitting his thigh for a snare drum. And you can use his foot as a kick, but he was actually playing. So the, the phase was actually pretty accurate because it was the same picture of the drum kit originally, right. just done in two parts. And he was a remarkable drummer because it's very difficult to play musically. It's just like oh, like a full drum kit. It's one thing if you're over them in a hat or over them in a ride, but he's yeah, actually yeah. top to bottom like that. Yeah, it's really, really hard. I mean, I've been made to try it with bands a couple of times. And you realize as soon as you start doing the cymbal overdub that it just feels terrible. Yeah. It's, I mean, you think like, oh, crashes. I mean, hat, forget about it. But even just crashes, there's something about the timing with the foot and the crash that if it's not the same, it just is. It's like right. flam. You have to be musical enough to know that there's a flam there. A lot of times, and that's you know that these days gets edited out. You know, just you yeah, know, the head of the beat. Let me put it on the beat or the symbols behind the beat. But realistically, in the drum kit itself, I mean, Mark Dernley, who's a famous English engineer, has done some of the greatest records of all time, in my opinion. Worked with ACDC, worked with uh, Crocus, worked with Loudness, worked with Uriah Heep. He's done some insane stuff. He's, he's a guy who kind of explained it to me early on in life. And he said, on a, on a piece of tape, you have 30 inches a second if you're going at 30 IPS. So in this 30 inch piece of tape, he goes, the kick drum is right here. And he goes, the bass player is probably a little behind the beat, so he's over here. The guitar player is always ahead of the beat, so he's up here. And this downbeat is huge. And then you get in the box and you start shifting things around. And now all of a sudden the kick is here, the bass is here, the guitar is here, and the downbeat is this big. So you have to have the, Use your, you know, use your ears or the foresight to know that there's imperfections in the music itself, but that's what makes it bigger. You know, so even even when it comes down to tuning and things like that, I'm like, sounds like I remember us trying to tune cutting the bass on medication two or three times on that on lullabies and just going, screw it, man. It just it feels good. It's slightly out of tune. Who cares? You know, but now you would just look at it and go, oh, shit, I got to melody that thing, man. You know, but back then, you're like, ah. Oh, F it. Yeah, well, there's nothing you can do. There's yeah. nothing. But but also, I mean, on, on the flip side of that, there are people who were doing guitars one string at a time, so that it'd be perfectly in tune on tape. You know, Mutt Lang's famous for doing that. And yeah. so the meticulous thing didn't start with Pro Tools. It just allowed everybody to be meticulous. Whereas it yeah. used to be like a real Mutt Lang used to use I heard 24 channels of AMS and used to just physically start moving stuff forward and back timing one of my yeah it, the story i heard was that they had yeah 24 so it was 48 channels because they were all stereo and because the track was on a 3348 
And so every track is going through an AMS on the way to the console. And he'd, they'd go around, they'd tweak, they'd move stuff, move stuff. And when they finished, like 46 of them had the same setting on them. But, but, but you know, but he was gonna, he was gonna go down that rabbit hole. Big time. I, I actually, when I first heard that story, it started making me think like that though. That's the beauty of the stories. You know, you're just like, you don't realize why Phil Rudd sounds so good in ACDC compared to the Chris Slade or compared to a different drummers. But in the end, you might go, okay, it's where he places his hi-hat, you know? So, so just being aware of those things as you're making records. I, I believe me, I couldn't make a record now without a computer. I love it. I love the ability to do things that we could never do on a tape machine. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not, I'm not, trying to fix stuff unless it's mandatory like for me just we would never um tune stuff and, and like if you put harmonies on you're like oh cool i mean you listen to the beatles this shit's out of tune but but you know so i go always go in with the approach of making a record like we did it on the days where you know there was tape and we only have 24 tracks sorry and that's it you're done <laughs> you know unless we were locking something up or dragging an eight out along with it so I still try yeah. to do that. I don't always end up doing that, but I still try to approach it like that. But the computer is unbelievable. And being able to isotope noise out of a, a yeah. humbucker strap pickup or whatever and making it dead quiet like a humbucker is like phenomenal to me because those things bother the hell out of me now. You know, when I hear noise, so I, go, huh. I don't mind hiss as much, but in a beautiful guitar solo where it's something sustaining and all you hear is buzz, I'm like, oh. exactly. Yeah. So you can easily fix the stuff that you always wish you could have fixed, but yeah. it's not you go looking for it. We tried anyway back then. I mean, we used to try to use bare denoisers and all kinds of weird stuff. Like, really. how do we expand this? Just, yeah, yeah. Or or get the guitar player like, okay, don't move. Don't. Exactly. Making oh. tape on the floor where the headstock should point this way because that's the quietest spot. Yeah. <laughs>